Dr. Nicole Lovett, please uh, introduce your background and why you sure. are uh, so So in this I trained area. in Manitoba in Canada. I started out my college degree in biochemistry and physics because I was obsessed with you know, understanding complex systems, problem solving. I then went into medical school. And during that time, I was recruited into the clinician scientist program where you take your medical degree, your MD, and then you also do a PhD at the same time. And I went into pharmacology, which is the science of drugs, how they work, how your body metabolizes them, what receptors they bind, what kind of drugs you can repurpose, how to evaluate clinical trials, new drugs. Are they good? Are they bad? What kind of market? going out on them. During that time, I focused specifically on women's health in my pharmacology PhD. So I focused on gestational diabetes and insulin resistance and female hormones indirectly, mainly through insulin. Um, after that, I went into residency in a rural family medicine residency program in a rural town called Portage La Prairie, Manitoba, where I did full spectrum family medicine, obstetrics, emergency room medicine, ICU, hospital medicine. And I really enjoyed that, um, but I always felt like my hands were tied. Like there was something I was helping people get healthier mm. than they were with diet, exercise, coaching, but they weren't getting 100% better. They were maybe getting 25, 30% better. When I met my husband, uh, Grant, in Grant, he was uh, doing law school in Grand Forks, he just, I decided to move to the States. And so for my first practice in America was actually at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and Austin. And I thought, geez, I'm going to learn so many innovative new techniques. And when I got there, I realized, well, this is yeah. just the same stuff you know, that everybody's doing, it's the guidelines. Um, practiced on the West Coast for a couple mm -hmm. of years with Providence Health. I taught at medical schools in residency programs and it was the same message over and over again. What did the guidelines say? And event husband and I, um, in 2021, mm -hmm. we decided to open our own clinic where I could do the work that I needed to do outside of the constraints of insurance and guidelines. And that's kind of where Firefly was born. Wow, what a story there. And you you don't look old enough to have all of that experience. So that's where <laughs> I really wanted you to go into it. From the, the basis of what we hear um, and from medical providers yeah. is a lot of the same things. And that's where I think it's so mm -hmm. interesting how you practice medicine. So given that approach that you aren't just mm -hmm. going by what the guidelines state, what is your approach at Firefly? How do you so look at each So I think a lot of my patients that have had this experience, I tend to ask all these seemingly random questions. And what I do is kind of hit all the major mm -hmm. hormone pathways. And I'm trying to understand that patient from when they were a child, maybe they even had a complicated birth or they were premature or they had something awful happen to them when they were young, all the way to whatever life stage they're at right now. So when you start asking really detailed questions, you'll say, oh, geez, you know, you started gaining weight when you went through puberty or you started gaining weight when you went on birth control or your hormones seem to have gone off the rails after a traumatic birth, like having a marriage after you deliver a mm -hmm. baby or mm -hmm. having lost a spouse and having gone through grief. And you can really attack that, uh, mm -hmm. that patient's problems with a really holistic, broad approach and actually understand them as an individual where they are in their life stage. And one of the big questions I ask people is, how do you feel on a scale between zero and 10. And zero's dead and 10's a superhero. It's very rewarding to see people mm -hmm. say, you know, most people start under three. And then they're saying things like seven, mm -hmm. eight, nine, and you idea of where are yeah. they now and where are they gonna go? Give us an example of some of the, um, you mentioned a couple of questions, but can you get a, a little deeper there yeah, on what so, kind of questions you're, you're asking? I had never yeah. heard another practitioner so ask I used them. Just start me, by asking ask them a lot of thyroid questions like, are you gaining belly fat? Do you feel cold? Are you the coldest person in the room? Um, have you noticed hair loss, thinning hair? Um, one of the big telltale signs for some women is actually they lose the lateral, the outer portion of their eyebrows. So if I see they've had microblading done, I'm like, hmm, like maybe you have a thyroid problem. You masked it with the mm. microblading. Um, I ask them about bowel movements. So a lot of my thyroid patients will say, they either have IBS symptoms, so diarrhea, constipation, or they've had severe constipation their entire life. Um, I also ask about depression. So thyroid hormone is mother nature's potent antidepressant. And some psychiatry providers in this country only use thyroid hormone for mental health. And so if you if mood, low motivation, you feel sluggish, brain fog's a big one. Um, and those kind of help me in the thyroid department. And then with, with women, Progesterone is, in my opinion, life. <laughs> Relaxes your neck, your mm -hmm. C spine, and your trapezius muscle. It 
puts you into a deep sleep. So if somebody's having sleep problems, that's a big telltale sign for me. And then menstrual problems. So I usually ask them, you know, when did you start having your periods? Were they regular, irregular? Did you have problems with acne, hair growth? I'm trying to get an idea of uh, how their basically their female physiology is functioning. Some of these symptoms people have been living with for so long, women have been living with for so long that they might not even um, be able to, to recognize them. Yes, for people that are alive, how can they be more cognizant of what's happening and be like, oh, maybe there is a You know, better that's a really, of, really good question. Life. I think um, it's really depends on the person. A lot of my patients that especially are, have gone through menopause already and they're, they're very stoic. It, you know, they've managed to survive with, you know, 30 years of symptoms or 50 years of symptoms. So I, what I try to t tell people is don't just tell me what's bothering you. I want to know, like, do you have bowel movements every day? If they say, oh, I'm normal, I, I say, well, how often are you going to the bathroom? And you kind of have to draw it out of some people. So you think of yourself as the most ideal human. You would be warm, you would be thin, you'd have muscle, you'd want to have sex, you'd, um, you'd be happy, you'd want to go outside and exercise. And so trying to think of, well, geez, am I like that? Or do I kind of drag myself through my day? Do I use coping mechanisms like alcohol or sleeping medication? Am I on antidepressants because my mood is poor? And then hopefully people can understand that maybe they're not feeling as good as they could be. So let's go with that of a lot of of, so my daughter is 12 and looking at the age of 12 to 20, how, or maybe even lo younger than that, how should we be talking to our daughters about our life changes and body What's changes? And really how interesting is symptoms? disorders like PCOS, which causes ovarian and thyroid dysfunction for your entire life. They actually, it actually is something you were born with likely according to church. So, oh. you st and you start cycling in your female hormones before you actually have your first period. So kind of like that. 12 age range, oh, you can already see yeah. that your daughter might be having mood swings and be cranky one day and happy the next. One cycling, painful periods, heavy periods are abnormal. Irregular periods after the first mm -hmm. year, after your first period, they should be regular. And so things like that, and unfortunately, this happened to me mm -hmm. when I was a teen, I just got put on birth control. I didn't have an awareness mm -hmm. of yeah. what was normal. And then I had a lot of side effects, like I gained about 100 pounds from birth control. And no, that, that was... Oh, a possibility wow. um, and kind of telling your girls like how yeah. do you feel are you are they sleeping are they anxious um, because that can be a sign that they're not making enough progesterone and then what is the I mean I know that with my daughter mm -hmm. I can get blood work and go to you but for those listening somewhere else in the country what, oh, I would the say it's, it's really great for anybody of any age to make sure they clean up their diet things that are not processed. Mm -hmm. um, soy can be really detrimental to young women because it acts like estrogen in the body. And if you do have heavy periods or regular periods, you already don't have enough progesterone. And so when you eat soy, you're kind of adding that estrogen into your diet that's going to make your symptoms worse. Um, gluten and sugar can be inflammatory mm -hmm. and also um, increase insulin resistance, which can worsen periods. So I know it's really hard to get kids to you know, buy into a healthy diet when they already feel pretty good because they're teenagers. But in terms of long-term reproductive health mm -hmm. and wellness, trying to eat really well, drinking lots of water, getting good sleep and minimizing, you know, caffeine, soda, that kind of stuff. You mentioned um, progesterone a lot. So let's get into progesterone and progesterone is life. Will you tell us? So progesterone uh, is um, intended to be a mood stabilizer in women and help anxiety. Um, have you, have you heard of the GABA receptor? GABA receptor no. is a receptor Tell in your brain more. and the natural hormone progesterone will bind it. GABA receptors cause relaxation in the brain. Alcohol and sleeping pills like benzodiazepines and Ambien try to be progesterone. They bind that receptor too, just not as well. So there's other side effects like addiction and rebound anxiety. Progesterone was designed to fit on that receptor and it causes brain relaxation. It pumps the brakes to calm everything down. That helps stop anxiety and it helps you turn your brain off so you can sleep well at night. Another big flag for progesterone deficiency is somebody that's sweating at night. And that was me until I started progesterone. I would be like, why am I sweating so much at night? But I'm still cold. And that's because progesterone regulates your body temperature. And one of the big symptoms you get leading up to menopause is hot flashes. Well, that's happening because you're not making progesterone anymore, but you're making tons of estrogen and your body temperature is dysregulated. I'm just getting 
So the progesterone, like um, also there seems to be more receptors for it in this, the neck and the upper muscles of the back. Men have more testosterone receptors in those areas. So when men are on gear or t high dose testosterone, they'll get really huge shoulders and backs because of that. Progesterone is the female equivalent. So it binds more there. So when I had chronic neck pain before I had progesterone. I couldn't move my head left and right. I was getting adjusted twice a week. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm not, I don't do physical labor. I've never had a neck injury. About a week or two on progesterone, completely gone. So my lack of progesterone that was causing all wow. that neck tension and neck pain. Well, personally, the side yeah. effects have been like that as well. Um, Dr. Lovett, for me, having that pill that I just put under my tongue and and I, it, just, it took me like a week to be like, well, why do I need this? And am I feeling anything? But it's a dramatic difference that I've been, it's been a month now. If someone needs progesterone, how do, how symptoms? are you diagnosed? Because with the, so hormones are like 5D chess because there's not, it's not only there's a brain, organ, body connection, but there's also chemicals that can affect how your hormone gets to the receptor in the cell or Maybe there's resistance to the hormone, like PCOS patients and thyroid, they need higher levels. So basically, if you don't have enough to control your symptoms, it really doesn't matter what your level is. So the level of 10 mm -hmm. and they feel amazing. Mm -hmm. Other women, when you're pregnant, mm -hmm. your level goes up to about 150 because your placenta just makes tons of it for you. And so we start with a baseline mm -hmm. lab. Some women have zero, like literally 0, 0.00 progesterone. Other women are still symptomatic, but their level's mm -hmm. five to 10. And so then we supplement and we get you feeling great. Mm -hmm. And then we see what that level is and we try to keep you there. From the, the blood work, can you explain uh, just a standard lab and then the additional so um, hormones Normally, so in my role when I was in primary care, I was basically allowed by insurance to order a CBC, a CMP, which is your electrolytes, liver enzymes, and maybe an A1C, a lipid panel, and a, a TSH which detects almost mm -hmm. zero problems. So I do all of those labs, but I also look at the free thyroid levels, both the inactive and active version to let me know, okay, your TSH is telling me how hard your brain is telling your thyroid to work, but how much are you actually producing? Mm -hmm. I'll make an analogy to measuring somebody's need for blood if they're hemorrhaging. I don't ask their body, are they working really hard to make blood before I give them blood? I give them blood, not making enough. So yeah. thyroid hormone, you need the TSH, the free yeah. T3, the free T4. And then I also test for autoimmunity in women for the most part. There's a very, very common autoimmune disorder called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, where you make antibodies against your thyroid. And I've picked up a lot of Hashimoto's in my practice. And the problem is if you don't capture that, that, that autoimmune will eventually destroy your thyroid. But by the time that happens, your TSH is so high you're diabetic, you have high blood pressure, you're depressed, and you've, you've already kind of burned the house down. So I do the, the, com the complete wow. thyroid hormone panel. I look at progesterone, estradiol. I'll usually measure LH and FSH, which are two hormones made by the brain that tell your ovaries to work. And I'm trying to look for signs of PCOS with those or definitive menopause. So when your FSH is over 50, you're in menopause. If your LH is greater than your FSH mm -hmm. and it isn't due to ovulation, you have PCOS likely. I look at free and total testosterone mm -hmm. levels. I measure something called SHBG, which is sex hormone binding globulin. It's basically like the Robin to the Batman of every hormone. So it carries it around in the blood and it has metabolic benefits. So I want it to be high, so I check that. If it's low, it's a marker of insulin resistance. I do a lipid panel. Optional, I can sometimes do an apolipoprotein profile, which tells me what your risk for Alzheimer's is, fasting insulin level, average blood sugar level, and then I also do something called the DHEA level. And DHEA is an adrenal hormone, and it's, the, it's called the daddy of all hormones because it leads to testosterone. And if it's really, really high for your age, it can be another line of evidence to support the PCOS diagnosis because those go hand in hand. So if you aren't producing or if you have a really low testosterone, then that's because your body Correct. isn't producing um, enough no, progesterone? No, low testosterone, so it, it depends. So I natural testosterone when you're younger and you're not in the perimenopause window, that can be a sign of PCOS, but not all women with PCOS have too much testosterone because there's kind of three different categories. Okay. Um, but if you have, let's say you're, let's say you're 50 years old, you're still having periods, but they're kind of spaced out. You're not really in menopause yet. 
a lot of those ladies will have low testosterone because their ovaries just aren't making it. So then in order to have a libido, you have to replace mm -hmm. it. One of the things that we talked about was mm -hmm. really heavy periods and that you don't need to live with them. That's not normal. So I, I was living with them for years, debilitating, like takes a day even like one day to me, I'm like, gosh, that's 12 days a year. And, and I probably wasn't the worst out of how many other women. If someone is experiencing those symptoms, what is so the- So in the, in the, in the perimenopause, the, you know, the 10 years before hormone that you lose is called inhibin control estrogen. High estrogen, like going from 50 one day to a thousand the next day makes you bloated, makes you feel crazy, and it makes you bleed because it thickens the lining. So maybe you should have this much lining and it goes all the way to this. And the other part of it is you might not have enough progesterone to counteract that estrogen, which they balance the lining out. So you're growing these big, thick lining, you're just hemorrhaging. So by adding in progesterone, you balance out mm -hmm. that estrogen and the lining doesn't get thick and you don't bleed as much. And that would be in place of, I had mentioned, is there, you have an ablation option you have i mean women have had hysterectomies due to this so avoid. there's opportunity to absolutely avoid. i think that hysterectomies yes. for dysfunctional uterine bleeding is the diagnosis or when you're having heavy periods around menopause it's i think it's awful because a lot of women don't realize when they get a hysterectomy a lot of women can't orgasm after they have incontinence they have pelvic floor problems they can start to create back pain and hip pain and you're missing organs that mm -hmm. you should have. And in you know, kind of basic, my basic mm -hmm. philosophy, if you have it, you probably needed it. We don't usually have organs we don't need. And so the, mm -hmm. I'd have a lot of patients that have had hysterectomies and if we had given them progesterone, we might have avoided it or we might have avoided the ablation. And you don't need to go, I think that we're trained of, okay, we're gonna go to the doctor and they're gonna cure us. They're gonna make us feel better. And okay, if, even if it's this extreme, well, I trust. And not that you shouldn't trust your practitioner. You should have a relationship. You should understand what the diagnosis is. You should look at your options. And that's why I'm having you on right now, because I think there's just a lack of awareness in this area of women's health and what the options are. And also I think credibility. I have, I see functional medicine doctors that say that they're hormone yeah. experts in women and men and cats, dogs. It's like, how can you be an expert in all of these different things? It doesn't, it just, it looks like, like that might be just an opportunity to bring patients in, but they don't necessarily Correct. Yeah, some of the what you do. I guess in terms of going to a doctor, if you're going to a surgeon, you're going to have a surgical problem. Okay, we don't want you to bleed to death. We have to cut your uterus out. In the medical school curriculum mm -hmm. for the last at least two generations has not talked about bioidentical hormones or hormonal regulation mm -hmm. for these problems. So they're not trained in it. So it's, not, it's hard to blame them for not offering it because they don't really know about it. There's a lot of different brands, you know, like, you know, I can't, I won't mention them by name, but companies that offer a certain hormone mm -hmm. product that give you a, a, a one day course on how to insert the product and how to, and you know, they ignore thyroid hormone, they ignore DHA, they only focus on a couple of hormones mm -hmm. and hormones are like a symphony. You don't want just a flute and a trombone, it'll sound, you need to optimize everything. Right. And so the training I took was with Worldlink Medical by a guy named Dr. Neil. He's an absolute genius. He's been doing this for 25 years. So there's women in the, you know, their 70s and 80s that were being treated in the 90s and that are doing really well. And his courses are four three-day weekends of 10 hours of talk talking about manuscript after manuscript, this randomized controlled trial, um, this evidence that tried to say that thyroid hormone is not important and what, you know, how, why they constructed the paper that way. And so you really want to know where they got their training and um, who's supporting them. So mm -hmm. like, do they have anybody to bounce anything mm -hmm. off of or mentor them? That's great advice. And that's something that when you call the practice, when mm -hmm. I call your practice and I talk with Sam, mm -hmm. Sam knew of these things and, and I went back and asked questions and then she asked you and you should be doing that prior to your visit if you are truly wanting to get the expert in this, in this area, right? I mean, there's, there's options out there. Uh, Moving to the topic of mm -hmm. uh, if you are trying to get pregnant, um, our introduction came through a beautiful soul that I met that she shared with me her journey. And I, I mean, it's like so moving to me that uh, when women's life changed because of your work. So yes. could you share with us some of that? 
um, of if you're I, trying to get pregnant? Um, I do treat for? a fair number of women with infertility and I'm doing everything up to the point of, okay, you need IVF. So we had our first firefly baby mm -hmm. born in January, had multiple oh, cool. miscarriages and a preterm birth with her second child. And her daughter was born pretty much term at, on a home birth, which was just exactly what she wanted. The key is if, if you have a hormonal underlying cause like PCOS, what that means is in the second half of your cycle, you don't make enough progesterone for the baby to stick. And so we place that progesterone early in the pregnancy to increase your chance of having the live birth. And if you have a preterm birth history, if you don't have any cervical problem, we can give you progesterone to kind of try to get you closer to a term baby. If you're having problems with ovulation, I use different medications like clomiphene or letrozole to make you ovulate. Um, we are in the process of getting equipment to do in, in office intrauterine insemination with, you know, partner product. And so that would be wonderful. But if you look at large groups of women that have two years where they didn't get pregnant, there was a study in, I think, 5,000 women. If you give them thyroid hormone, 80% of them can even a year. And IVF is definitely a, it's a revenue yeah. source, gen, revenue generating uh, business. And yeah. so there are other avenues that, yeah. uh, such as thyroid. I yeah, mean, thyroid and hormone replacement. and making sure, so baby Therapy. gets all of their iron and vitamin D and vitamins from mom. And I also do a vitamin panel when you, when I start treatment. Mm -hmm. So when the women are trying to get pregnant, we're very aggressive with getting their vitamin D levels optimized, their iron levels up, because we know that baby is going to get all their vitamins from mom. And, and you feel great. Everyone that's listening, I feel so great and energized. And my symptoms were my hair was falling out. But I mean, I had symptoms for years that I just was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm 42 now. I can I just have to <laughs> sail into the sunset like this. I loved hearing you. It, it was just so refreshing. And I... I can't wait to now see my, my levels, my blood levels. A couple of things that I wanted to come back to. There's um, a lot of aesthetic studios, clinics that are offering what we were talking about is, you know, testosterone pellets, like pellets that can be inserted. And I have never done it. And I hadn't done it because I had some friends that have had with not great side effects. It does seem, I was skeptical because you walk in and you can just get this treatment without really any baseline. Like, like how exactly. do they know what it's, you need? Um, it's unfortunate because I don't want this hormone industry to get compromised because it's, I'm helping people. I never want to stop. Mm -hmm. I never want to stop my hormones, but it's so lucrative. If you're walking in to get Botox and they have a pellet in the fridge, and they can get you to consent to put it in without blood work or follow up. They made a lot of money on that pellet. It's, mm -hmm. And it's like they doubled their revenue for that appointment. I, they, there's so many, right. so many side effects you can get, like acne, massive hair loss, hirsutism, where you grow like a beard or upper lip hair. You can get an enlarged clitoris if you overdose and you don't have any control. Once that pellet's in, it's in for three to six months and you're going to this. You're going to have a big spike and then you're going to fall. Whereas the cream that I use, once it builds up in your system and you're good, you're going to stay there as long as you put the cream. And if we do overdose you, we can stop and it'll go down within a few weeks. You're not going to be riding out a six month pellet. Um, yeah, it's, it, right. it's like, you're not, it's like being put on one medication, like an antidepressant on an online, you know, antidepressant company. And then they don't follow up. They just send you Lexapro mm -hmm. for a year. It's like, that's kind of this. <laughs> It is very dangerous. I want to make sure that my, I have teenage boys and I saw that he was on. So Tover, if you're on, you should probably get up because I'm going to talk <laughs> about something that just, you don't want to hear. But it's really important to mm -hmm. women and that's our libido. And when we lose our libido and our desire, that affects your marriage. It affects your self-confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many, it's just spirals. And can we talk about the loss of libido and how to get that back up? Because that's something that I did express as a that's symptom great. and I already Yeah, so the um, there's a total testosterone level in the, in the human body. Women have testosterone just like men do. Men usually have 20 times as much, but women still have some. There's no one that's hornier than a man on testosterone. Just them in general and then get to so, testosterone. Oh, boy. The, the okay. amount that's active, actually free to bind the receptor is the free testosterone. Usually for women to have a libido, they need to be in the two to four range. Um, and so we try to get the, we have to give the total testosterone high enough so that the freeze about two to four. Some women need even higher levels. It really depends on like the endocrine disrupting chemicals in their body, their lifestyle, their genetics. 
And it's just like a, a light switch. So once it goes over a certain amount, boom, you have a libido. And so and lucky women will have it mm-hmm. sooner than others, but usually it's the 68 week mark. If we, if we nail the dose, it'll kick in and it will be a desire. Mm-hmm. And the other part of treatment is if your thyroid's optimized and you have progesterone, that means you're sleeping well, you're maybe a little skinnier, you're feeling cuter, you're feeling more outgoing, you have more energy. And that also mm-hmm. contributes to your libido because when you feel bloated and sad and cold, you're not really in the mood. Oh yeah. And especially yeah. when you live in a climate like we do yeah. and it gets dark at five fifteen, it's like, oh, I'm gonna get in my jammies and go to bed. <laughs> I don't want to show anyone well, my body. Cold, right? I used to run out of the shower and have to go under the bed covers to get warm again so I could change. It was ridiculous. That coldness, it really is like um and no one else is cold. It's so weird because you hear about hot flashes, but that cold feeling, you're like, oh, I'm just a cold person. It's like well, no, you right. probably aren't just a cold person, right? So that I, I can think back to a couple of um, times that I've said that to people, and I'm like, oh, I probably, <laughs> I should go back to them and tell them how. You know, how all I signs is if you're sitting <laughs> indoors and you have to have a space heater on your legs or you're wearing your winter jacket inside, there might be a problem. You put me on, mm-hmm. let's go back, let's go to the supplements. Um, one, I, I really liked how you said, well, one with the progesterone and then also the yeah. B12 to put it directly under yeah. your so tongue. The B12 you tell me about that? is part of a metabolic pathway that becomes succinyl CoA, which is the factor that gets fed into something called the Krebs cycle, which is basically how your mitochondria inside your cells make cellular gasoline, your energy. So I try to get my patients B12 mm-hmm. levels mm-hmm. up even above normal for a while because what's in the blood is what the cells feed themselves on. So it's kind of like putting out a buffet of B12 and the Mm -hmm. cells can come and help themselves to as much as they want. The B12 really helps with energy. It can help neurological function, so brain function. Um, A lot of um, diabetics are deficient in it because metformin depletes the body of B12. And so that's when they get like neuropathy or numbness in their feet. It can be related to B12. And so I try to get my patients levels up and by Putting it under the tongue, you're bypassing your gut. So it can go right into the bloodstream. I like that. It does make a difference. How about the other vitamins? So um, depending on the life stage and the level, I'll put people on supplemental DHEA to get them their level up to optimal. That helps with metabolism and brain function. Um, Pregnenolone is another one. Pregnenolone is the mommy of all hormones and there's receptors for it. And some women, a lot of women with PCOS actually get a lot of benefit from that in terms of memory and brain function. Um, other women are, it's mild and they stop it after three months, but the women that do notice the benefit, they really like it. Um, thyroid patients usually get put on magnesium and selenium because they help your body make inactive thyroid hormone into active. And magnesium is just a great supplement for everyone to be on for blood sugar control, anti-inflammation. Um, and then I try to optimize everyone's vitamin D levels. Vitamin D is actually a hormone, not a vitamin. And it's involved in our immune system, our brain and can be contribute to depression. Um, and that's kind of one of the roles of seasonal affective disorder where you get depressed in the winter is actually vitamin D mediated. So again, I try to get people up, you know, high to the higher range of normal. Um, and then other, you know, sometimes I'll put people on zinc for their immune system or for testosterone support. Um, we also have like a daily multivitamin. All my supplements come from MedQuest Pharmacy, which is a compounding pharmacy that Dr. Ruzia uses. And so they're very, well seasoned, they have excellent quality product and they don't have um, gluten and other things and fillers in their supplements. And they're, they kind of guarantee the level coming up with their, with their medication. And so we have like a vitamin C, some women that are iron deficient, I'll put them on that with some iron supplement. Um, we have uh, melatonin, which I really love, um, not only for a sleep aid, but because it's sustained release, it gives you hours of anti-inflammatory effect as well. And there's evidence that it helps with um, controlling like the growth of prostate cancer, for example, by inducing cell death in cancer cells. So that's something that people, I usually will introduce that once they've gotten over the, I'm on so many medicines right now (laughs) phase. Wow, that's really interesting. I've never heard of that side effect of uh, melatonin. The iron that um, I had uh, purchased is uh, beef liver iron that you recommended. And one that I was using yeah. uh, was a vegan iron. Can so you explain the difference the between the two? Plant-based plant iron is a, it's a plant heme. So the actual iron structure is not very bioavailable. And bioavailable means that you can actually 
absorb it and use it. And so a lot of the, any, any vegan or plant-based iron supplement, in my opinion, is just expensive stool. An animal-based heme, and it's, your body can absorb it better and actually use it to make us more blood, which we're animals, and we're going to use animal heme better. It is a difference how you process that iron, the beef liver iron, mm -hmm. versus I was using Vitron. And I mean, I was end up, ended up being constipated for days having mm -hmm. this, the Vitron. And yeah. it, you can tell that it's more natural, just the only with how the downside is some people, depending everything. on the amount of capsules of beef liver they're on, they can get some constipation. So you have to find the dose that you can tolerate. I love beef liver because it's mm -hmm. mother nature's vitamin. Like it's got vitamin A, K2, everything. It's like a multivitamin. If you just could get beef liver, that would be fine. And, and we don't eat liver anymore. Mm -hmm. We used to, mm -hmm. we used to have liver once a week. There's no doubt looking around people used to be a lot more healthy 50 years ago than they are now. Oh, you can see it yeah. when you look back on pictures yeah. of a uh, beach, all of the and, women in bikinis, very firm. The, the men are much yeah. leaner. I mean, everyone is just a lot leaner. It's all comes down to diet and the and, amount of processed foods. I would yeah. and our, think and our, exercise. Um, iodine intake is much lower. We have a lot more endocrine disrupting chemicals and they changed the dietary guidelines to demonize meat and saturated fat and substitute it for processed sugar. So if you want to get diabetes, eat a high carb diet. And it's, it's, I mean, my, literally my mm -hmm. animal model when I was in my, in my graduate studies was giving pregnant female rats diabetes, feeding them sugar water. That's how we did it. And that's when yep. we're drinking Mountain Dews and Coca-Cola's all day. We're just yep. putting it right into our system. The last thing that you, um, before we go, is you recommended mm. a continuous glucose monitor. And I thought that, so I, I did wear mine, unfortunately, when oh. I did hot yoga. It ended up falling off, so I have to go back and get mine. Um, but it was, it was something that I had never done before. And there's a lot of, um, there's NutriSense out there. I think a, a lot of the companies right now have more mm -hmm. of a robust um, digital experience that yeah. is around $250 a month. And it's, I mean, to me, I'm thinking, well, do I want to spend $250 a month that, on that? Or would I rather buy really high quality vitamins and uh, things that I can put in my body? But um, if you can get a continuous glucose monitor, mine with insurance was $36 and it would lasted for 14 days if I wore it appropriately. Can you tell me, uh, can you just show so one of the things the that I now? really don't like in general medicine is we give everybody the same advice. And that advice is usually mm -hmm. sponsored by whatever industry sponsored the dietary guidelines. So right now it's plant-based diets. So just eat healthy, you have to eat less, move more, and you'll get thinner. Well, every single person is different, has a different hormonal milieu. So put the glucose monitor on and see what happens to you when you eat a banana and or a bowl of rice or a steak. And you can have that visual feedback of, my blood sugar didn't change when I ate a steak, but it went up by 100 when I ate a banana. I guess I shouldn't eat a banana if I want my blood sugar to stay like this. Also contributes mm -hmm. to fatigue, anxiety, jitteriness. Um, and so if you can keep that flat line, you're going to lose weight faster and feel better. Jittery yeah. and fatigue in the afternoon, that seems to be everyone's yep. problem. I mean, everyone, right? Like mm -hmm. you go, you, the coffee shop yes. is so busy at two o'clock. What, what's going on in our bodies? Probably, a, I mean, it's probably a lot of things, but one of the big things people do is they eat like a really big lunch and they have a big carbohydrate load. And what that does is it makes your pancreas dump a large amount of insulin into the body. And then that's when you get the sluggishness, you know, two hours after your meal. And it's a um, postprandial or after eating hormone effect because insulin's a hormone too. And so if you, that's why people who do intermittent fasting talk about, you know, really good mental alertness. That when the hunger goes away, they feel more awake and lots of energy. And that's because their insulin level is super low and they're not creating any ins sugar spikes that create an insulin spike. So the people that are crashing out in the afternoon, they have to think about what they ate two or three hours earlier. And part of that can be mm -hmm. um, hormonal yeah. as well uh, from yeah. fatigue, right? Just overall. Yeah, you, you have a cortisol spike balance. early in the morning that creates that arousal response to wake you up. And then you're supposed to be, you have to have thyroid hormone throughout the day. Um, and then you're supposed to secrete melatonin at night to make yourself sleep. So if these things aren't all aligned, sleep is a 
huge risk factor for weight gain and, and mental health issues. And so that's, again, mostly mediated by hormones. And a consistent sleep pattern rather than, okay, every day I'm mm -hmm. going to wake up Monday through Friday, six o'clock, and then go to bed at 10. But then on the weekends, I'm going to sleep mm -hmm. until 11, go to bed at two. What, what's our body doing there? That's um, in terms of why our, do our sleep patterns change? You want a consistent sleep pattern? Does that really even do anything? Or are we okay with it depends having our weekends? On, I think that there's relaxed. some benefit to allowing yourself to sleep to satiety. So like you nap up, um, mm -hmm. there's, some, there's catch up mm -hmm. sleep. Um, there's something called sleep debt. So if you're chronically sleep deprived, and some of my patients go through this during the first few months of treatment, they're like, I'm sleeping all the time. Well, you haven't slept in five years. Like, do know that shift oh. workers, and this is me too, because I still work in the emergency room. Um, if you get woken up at night re repeatedly, it does increase insulin resistance and inflammation and stress. And so you try not to disrupt your deep sleep, your nighttime sleep as much as possible. But there's no harm really in, you know, sleeping in on the weekend if your body needs that. It's good for it. You're, that, it's like drinking water, mm -hmm. right? You're giving and it unfortunately, what your body needs. Unfortunately, we are so well, stuck good. to other people's schedules that we have to disrupt our own circadian rhythms all the time for jobs or, you know, social gatherings um, and commitments. So get your sleep, people, on mm -hmm. the weekends. Take that time to sleep in. <laughs> There's been so many great people on here. Let's see if, um, and men can have have um hormone imbalances as yes. well is that something that you recommend um mm -hmm. yeah um looking there, into? so there's no female hormone clinic anywhere for a few hundred miles but there are a few male hormone clinics but i do things a little differently um i'm more evidence-based a lot of the uh, chains um of male hormone clinics they block things like estradiol which give men heart disease and erectile dysfunction so and they only optimize testosterone so they don't care about any of the other hormones which again that's like having a symphony with just trombones and it's like it's like you're not seeing the full picture right we have a question of anything we can integrate into our diet or supplement routine to get so on track magnesium everybody hormones. can benefit from that um i usually recommend magnesium glycinate because it's better absorbed um i recommend everybody especially in this climate it's probably safe for everyone to be on at least 2000 to 4000 units of vitamin d a day and then i rec i recommend if you're going to eat for longevity and athleticism, a low carbohydrate diet, so high protein. Don't be scared of animal fats, butter, cream, um, healthy plant oils, which would be avocado or olive, um, avoiding seed oils, plant oils, and sugar. So juice, soda, processed milk, that kind of thing. This is, there are so many oh, of your um, patients that are on here saying it's life changing. So that is just so amazing um someone says i have been with dr lovett since august of last year i've lost 40 pounds by getting my hormones in check and that's i think so life-changing because it is you can constantly be on this wheel of what in the heck is going on i'm doing everything right and then you know the point yep. you just want to throw it out the window like i'm just done and i'm i'm just going to be like and this a lot of forever so and, that's um, medications that's that affect their hormones and they're not aware one of the common classes is um, SSRI, so antidepressants, and insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So they can be responsible for 20 or 30 pounds. And people don't realize, yeah, I started gaining weight after I went to the antidepressant. Wow. What? Really? Mm -hmm. That is very interesting to me. I have never heard that it's a side effect. I'm interesting. So what would you recommend as a starting point for for a PCOS so, um, weight our, loss? Our process is, it's an initial consultation, which is about an hour. Um, you can either do that over a video visit or on in person in the office. And myself and my PA Sarah can do that. Uh, Sarah can practice in North Dakota. She, we sit down and we go through the whole life story. Like, what were you like as a kid? When do you think you started to feel not yourself anymore? Have you always felt like not very well? At that visit, we order blood work. I use a cash pay lab in Colorado. So we draw it in our office, but we ship it to them. And that, I mean, your experience too, if I labs through insurance, they yeah. can be $2,500 to $5,000. If I use cash pay lab, three, $400. And so we save a lot of money by knowing the price up front. Yep. And then we meet back again for another hour to go through all the results and make a treatment plan. And at that point you can decide, I, or I can decide, yeah, you know what? You're actually pretty good. I wouldn't do anything. And some people I do turn away, like you're fine. Keep doing what you're doing. Other people, I, if they're very sick, if they have really mm -hmm. high blood sugars and they have multiple medical problems, yes, we need to go, 
you know, all guns, everything has to be done. And then other people might be, you know, just wanting to be better than they are, but they're already okay. And we make the treatment plan and then we usually schedule follow-ups every four to six weeks initially, which will get spread out as people get more and more optimized. And you yes, are licensed Minnesota, in North Dakota? South Dakota, Montana, Idaho, and Washington State. That's amazing. So they can, mm -hmm. you can treat via telemedicine then yeah. if those patients live in those um, states. If you live in North Dakota and you're moving somewhere else, you can get treated yes. now and then you can move. So you can then, which yes. happened with our, our friend. So Continuity. you can continue mm -hmm. treatment. And if mm -hmm. someone is, say, in Wisconsin, they could come to North Dakota and visit you. And then you yes. can continue yeah. treating them as your it patient. It has that established okay. care. Established care. That's what... That's what that is. It's very important. But uh, how about, I know that you're, you are in the process of renewing your website. What's the best way um, for people to learn? So more on our website, practice? you can Actually click it. a link that lets you email um, our clinic director, which is actually my husband, because we do everything together. Um, and he can kind of direct that person to me or Sam or whoever, or Sarah. Um, the other way to call uh, is you can call the clinic um, at 701-757-1440 um, during the week and or leave a message and then we usually call people back and schedule them that way. The other way people can book is that there's an app, um, a mind on mind body, and you can find you can book a consult mm -hmm. using your phone. And everyone should have mind body too. This last comment here, this is really interesting. I just love these comments from your current patient. And it says, Dr. Lovett also treats my daughter with Down syndrome. She has better mental functioning and weight loss. And basically she has reversed the rapid aging of yeah. her body. It is so amazing. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is incredible. Never would have, never would have um, even thought of that. So I, gosh, I have all these <laughs> members of my family that I can refer to yep. now. We just Eventually when to Grand Forks. Here, I'll <laughs> cut, I'll be able to help out and maybe take a couple days a month and go to Fargo or start practicing in Fargo as well. Cause I have, I'd say probably about 20% of our patients live in Fargo. So I have to try. Travel. Okay. Just don't travel during the winter yeah. months when we have those blizzards, right? 29 is crazy. I've never experienced anything like the blizzards around here, but it has been an absolute pleasure. I'd love to do this again. Uh, Dr. Lovett, I'm very thankful for you taking time out of clinic um, to just educate me as well as everyone yes, that was thanks. on. Thank you everyone for joining and we'll do another lunch and learn. Uh, I don't know if you set the bar really high. Thank you so much, Patty. Love it. So thank you very much. Bye. All right. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye, everyone.